name's Alan Coburn, and I was, I wouldn't say content to this, but <laughs> volunteered by somebody else to MC this meeting here tonight, um, which you know all about and, and, and why the meeting is being called. I just have to tell you that the meeting is being recorded in video, um, and the time frame we would like to try and complete the business by nine o'clock if we can, so um, we're going to move on fairly quickly. I've been asked to explain the purpose of the meeting. The meeting is to inform the community, as a lot of questions have been asked in relation to the comments that were made um, public by uh, Councillor East and the members of our community board. Um, that we're looking for support for the omission from the district plan to be reinstated and requiring an independent inquiry onto how this has happened. So that's the reason for the meeting and we would like to try and keep it to, to that topic if we can. Um, we have some people to thank, I believe here we've got people that have, have very short notice went out of their way to help promote this um, meeting tonight and gee whiz, looking at the crowd tonight, they've done pretty well, haven't they, on um, two days, two days of notification. So I'd just like to mention Blair and Stu from Paper Plus in New Brighton for the photocopying and printing of the flyers, Susie Brown from Weber Brown Collaborations for graphic design work, everyone who pounded the pavement for delivery of the flyers. And while we're talking about that, how many of you um, are here tonight because you've got a flyer in your letterbox? Could you just raise your hands? Because they would just like to know if it's worthwhile. There we are. The shoe rubber was well worth it. So, so well done to those foot sloggers. And the team would also like to thank the many people that sent kind messages of support. Um, before we get uh, on to the, uh, the order, which will be, uh, you'll be addressed by Councillor Dave East, then um, Kim Money, Chair of the, Co uh, of the Coastal Burwood Community Board, Tim Sinters, Deputy Chair, and then Daryl Latham. Daryl um, is a member of the Linwood Central Hepcat Community Board. Um, from him, we will then go to Warwick Schaefer, who is Deputy Chair of the Christchurch Coastal Residents United and there are one or two people here that have indicated they just want to talk on some of the issues that they've had lately in relation to the district plan. So we will there'll be a time at the end for question time. Please keep them brief and remember this is just a public meeting that we, we don't want it to get out of hand. Keep the decorum, as everyone in this area does all the time, so I know that we haven't got any problems in that respect. And um, we'll get through pretty nicely. Um, we've had a lot of apologies for people that can't come but have, have wished, wished us all very, very well for the, for the evening. And, I, and one in particular I, I would just like to read to you from, and some of you may have read this, this in the paper the other day from Sir Tiffany O'Regan, who was a, a resident of our district. And I'll read this letter to you. Courage Admirable is what he's titled it. I have considerable admiration for the courage and sturdy independence being displayed by Councillor David East in the bureaucratic and political turmoil in which he currently finds himself. He has quite properly stood up against the bureaucratic impropriety of the council and responded as he should the deep resentment and sense of justifiable grievance within his electorate. He has sought and received advice and confirmation as to the facts at issue at the highest level of due process. Councillor East and other elected representatives have pursued the question of the unauthorised removal of provisions deliberately inserted by the independent hearings panel into the district plan. It is alleged staff have admitted removing the provisions on the basis that they disapproved of them. These imperious subalterns of the bureaucracy seem to have misused their authority to the great disadvantage, stress and cost to rate paying residents. Now the politicians are moving in to shelter them. Given the apparent circumstances, 
it is deeply ironic that the baton being swung goes by the name of Code of Good Conduct. Thank you. So I'd now like to call on our councillor of the Coastal Ward, um, David East, to address you. I'm not graced with the same height. <laughs> um, firstly, um, it's been an extremely exhaustive week. And um, I acknowledge the support that I've had from my um, three fellow conspirators, Tim Sinters, Kim Money, and Daryl uh, Latham. Oh, look, I'd, I'd really like to start first in this address by just asking the question, what is the role of a councillor? A councillor is elected to represent the uh, best interests of the community of Christchurch in the first place. And secondly, he's elected by his people and his electorate to act in the best interests of the people of that electorate. I believe uh, the action that we have taken does um, is symbolic of that um, definition. I just want to tonight to address you, just I'm going to take some excerpts out of the um, press release we delivered last week and uh, make a few more comments. So in my, it is my view that the alleged tampering has impacted on numerous Christchurch property owners, particularly in South New Brighton, South Shore and the Red Cliffs communities. If I'm correct, then it could be argued that we have denied residents of their legal rights as determined by the Independent Hearings Panel. There is the potential issue of economic loss. And although actual estimate of economic loss is unknown at this stage, it has been suggested that it could well run into millions. What are often overlooked are the socio-psychological impacts on the people of the communities caught up with such uncertainty, huge emotional stress and community upheaval. I am aware of people that have abandoned their plans and their neighbourhoods, all of which are effects that you cannot price. One may liken this alleged tampering with legal process as being a seismic event of uncertainty imposed on a community that is already suffering the effects of seismic upheaval in the Christchurch earthquake sequence. Now, uh, some may ask, uh, why did we take this action? Over a period of many, many months, we've had uh, CCRU have had meetings with council, the Residents Association have had numerous meetings, community boards have met uh, and discussed the things, we've had forums, and in all of these instances, we get nowhere. So I, I liken it to a... Um, policy of deny, defer, delay. So after seeking advice and considering my obligations in my capacity as an elected member of the Christchurch City Council, I considered that the most appropriate course of action was to bring these matters to the attention of the people in my constituency and the city also, to raise my concerns with both the Office of the Prime Minister and the Minister of Local Government. My expectation is that they will recognise there is a legal basis for undertaking an independent investigation and they will appoint an appropriate person with the necessary experience to oversee the investigation. I wish to make it very clear that what I am seeking is an independent investigation in respect of a serious allegation concerning the appropriateness and right reliability of the process followed by those officials supporting the independent hearings panel in their final determination of stage three, chapter five of the Christchurch City District Plan, in other words, decision 53. 
Um, I'd just like to touch now on some issues raised by the chair, former chair of the Independent Hearings Panel, Sir John Hanson. Over a number of months, I have had several conversations with Sir John, uh, the former chair of the Independent Hearings Panel, regarding the onerous conditions that the district plan imposes on the area. Sir John has indicated to me that this was not the intention of the panel and has written to me clearly outlining the steps and processes that the panel took in coming to their final determination. In February 2016, the Independent Hearing Panel issued a minute directing the Council to supply new maps and data indicating what a restricted discretionary building policy would look like. Council made it quite clear through their Council that they did not want to have this provision in the plan but were directed to provide the information and were advised that they could make their comments during the final deliberations. Council came back with a revised version. However, the Independent Hearings Panel concluded that the revised version was still too onerous on landowners within the RUO. That's residential overlay. We do get sort of hung up a wee bit on our acronyms. The relief they granted was to ensure that owners of residentially zoned land were given the right to apply to build new residential dwellings subject to meeting the requirements of a restricted discretionary application. This was to be done on a non-notified basis. Sir John stated in his letter that his understanding is that while the RDA rule is included in the plan, the policy, as set out by the panel, was at some stage omitted from the planning provisions that accompanied and formed part of Decision 53. It's important to note that a significant number of minor corrections and omissions were dealt with by the IHP, but at no stage was this matter raised by Council. Sir John concluded, I'm not sure of the exact timing but it would appear, would appear that the omission of the policy was known before our jurisdiction ceased. In my opinion, this is Sir John again, the significance of such an omission of policy, no, sorry, this is me. <laughs> um, in my opinion, the significance of such an omission of the policy could be likened to a High Court judge making a determination in a case and the law clerk amending the wording because it went against his own ideology in the matter. It's all give, also given rise to speculation that if one part of the district plan has allegedly got some irregularities, are there other sections that have similarly not been approved as the IHP intended? So the IHP had I believe, well, I'm absolutely confirmed, uh, confirmed with this, that there is a clear statement of due, that they wanted this uh, policy in their determination, and it's also my um, assertion that, a, that there has been a process, a statement of, sorry, that due process has been undermined in this um, uh, consideration. So, for the above reasons, I believe that the scope of, the, of an inquiry must consider a review of the district plan to ensure that the final determination of the IHP was accurately re recorded in the approved version. We, at our press release, had um, statements from attributed to Kim Money and Tim Sinters, where at meetings they had heard clear statements from staff, uh, clear, clear statements, I say, of complicity, and um, that's been recorded. Uh, Kim herself, uh, I believe, is a woman of great uh, principle, and uh, she tells me that as she heard what was said, she wrote it down. It has been said to me um, during in council 
that uh, perhaps what you think you heard is not actually what you heard. So, just concluding, we are extremely concerned about the impact of the omission of this clause from the final decision on the residents of South Shore and Redcliffe's uh, particularly. We are here today to hear from you that you approve of our actions. We ask you to sign the petition. It's either circulating or at the back of the room or maybe even at the front of the room. We have uh, contacted the, minister, the Office of the Prime Minister and the Minister for Local Government to reinforce a call for an inquiry as to how when and why this happened. We reaffirm our primary objective is to reinstate the missing clause back into the Christchurch City Council District Plan. Um, I'd just like to thank you all for attending. We are absolutely overwhelmed by the level of support we have been given from all areas of Christchurch, all walks of life, and especially from this community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Now we are I'm going to call up the chair of the Coastal Burwood Community Board, Kim Money, um, to address you. I'll be quick and brief. Uh, David has covered most of the issues that you need to be um, hearing and understanding, and also the gentleman behind me will be um, following up as well. So, um, but I'd just actually like to start with some thanks. Firstly to David. David, um, for the actions he has taken to represent this community, and in fact the city at large. We are in full support of the actions that he has taken to date. David has a passion for this community and wants to see the best for it as we do. So thank you, David. I want to say thank you to Tim and Daryl. These two, like David, work tirelessly for their communities, for our communities, and in regards to this issue, around the clock. To see things put right, so thank you, team. We also want to thank the Christchurch Coastal Residents United, CCRU, for all the work that they have done to help bring this issue to the fore. Thanks also. <laughs> now, I don't often get to say this very much, but thanks also to the media um, for asking the hard questions. Thank you. Um, thanks also. We really have to have a really big thank you to our families and our friends who have just rallied behind us and um, been awesome. So thanks very much, all of you. And lastly, but most definitely not last or least, you, the community. Thank you so much for the way you have got behind us to see um, resolution and restitution. As David has already said, we have been absolutely blown away, the, blown away by the backing we have received from you all. Thank you for your encouragement, rallying and offers to help. Your presence here tonight is just another way you are showing that you are here to support the affected communities your elected reps and to see things brought to the light um, so that we can all move forward together. This omission has brought huge trauma to many families and it will continue to do so until the omitted um, paragraph is reinstated and investigated. So tonight we have gathered to inform you but also to generate momentum to move forward in a way that brings true resolution. As I've already said, there has been significant and emotional and financial costs that this omission has caused for our communities. We have brought this out into the public arena as this is not okay. This is unjust. As a community and city, we need to have confidence in our council processes. For this to happen, firstly, um, the enabling paragraph must be reinstated, and secondly, there needs to be an independent inquiry as to how and why this omission came about. 
If you haven't already um, done so, as David has said, there's a um, petition forms here which you can sign, but you can also add additional comments to if you like. Um, as your elected representatives, we will continue to advocate for this until we are confident that our combined community and city voices have been heard. So thank you very much for getting behind us and thanks very much. It's just an absolutely amazing, huge crowd. Um, so thanks for taking the time to come up out tonight. So we couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm now going to ask the Deputy Chair of the Coastal Berwick Community Board, Tim Sinters, the South Shore Warrior, <laughs> to um, come and say a few words. I'm, I've known Tim for my whole life, basically, and, but I do know that he, he works tirelessly to try and make sure that the people in our coastal water are being looked after. He's a mind of knowledge. He knows a lot about the sea and being an old fisherman. In fact, you're quite well dressed tonight. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> quite impressed. I so, without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Tim, the Deputy Chair of the Coastal Burwood Community Board. Actually, one of the first things is somebody sitting on my glasses. <laughs> I've lost them somewhere. So, I hate to borrow Tim's. That's okay, so don't laugh, please. I suppose you're asking, look, why are we here? And why do we do this? I think Dave's explained it very well, and so has Kim. Look, I'm, out, I'm about with the community all the time. I actually, I, I hear and feel what everybody says in this area. People come to me with their problems, and I take them you know, very, very personal. And three of us, and including Daryl, we see an injustice done here. And I'll tell you what, I find it so hard to come home from some meetings after talking to people and finding what's not happening how it's affecting people's lives, I think it's actually disgusting. And I just think it's got to stop. We've got to, we've got to move on. We have gone to council, we have talked about the mental stress. I see it, I see what it's doing to communities. It's, it's, it doesn't just stop with the people that's affected. It actually affects the people around them as well. And just because you're all fine in your house, doesn't, and your neighbour is having a tough time, you actually feel that for that person. And that's actually what our community's about. We actually care for each other. And so it affects everybody. It, it's a stigma that we don't need. And when you hear about people who are investing so much money into their properties and then finding out they can't build, they've found their dream section, they've designed their house, they've gone through the right procedure, and then find they can't build, can't get their three, four hundred, five hundred, whatever, dollars, thousand uh, dollars back. Can you imagine how shattering that is? And for the community, it's just so wrong how, how this is now affecting people. Um, I don't know how many people have come to me over the last probably year with this problem and it's, um, I can see it affecting the whole community and it just doesn't stop at South Shore. In fact, actually, can I have a show of hands for people who are in South Shore here, please? So, pretty good turnout from South Shore. Uh, New Brighton? Thank you. Uh, South Brighton? So we've got a pretty cross-section here, a pretty good cross-section. And elsewhere, elsewhere. So other places are... There are other places around the place. <laughs> it's good. I thought it stopped at the bridge. Um, look, it's, uh, look, everybody's here for the same reason. We all feel for the community. We hate seeing what's done to it. And all we're asking is, please fix it. Just change the rules. Just stop making our job so hard. As a community board member, we're your servants. We actually do, you know, we work for you. We don't work for council, we work for you. And you come to us and you expect us to do the best we can for you, which we try to do. And when we actually hit a brick wall, we have no choice to do but we, with, with, with what we've just done. It's, uh, it's the most frustrating way of getting something done. Didn't like doing what we had to do, but it feels right. I'm actually sleeping better than I've slept for ages because it's off in my conscience now. I'm actually out there speaking to the community. I, I feel like we've had a voice, it's heard, and you can tell by the numbers of people here they're all for us. So look, thanks so much, but we've got to get this sorted out. We really need your support. Do you think we've done the right thing? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Look, and that's, that's fantastic. Thanks so much. We didn't do it lightly. You know, it's a big thing, it's a big thing for what Dave did. 
and as a team we support them. Between Kim and I and Dave, there's about 160 years of local knowledge here. <laughs> Dave's the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, that, honestly, there's a lot of knowledge here, and because you know we're so well connected in this area, you know, we're, we're all the coast. We're not just South Shore, South Brighton, Brighton. We're all coast people, and we all hurt for each other. You know, we don't think, oh, that's their problem. We think, well, it could be us next time. So this is why we've got to stop this. And we've got to move on. We've got to give people some hope. Let them move on with their life and just worry about power bills, the petrol going up. Not all the other things that we shouldn't be going on. We've all been through earthquakes, EQC, and now to have this fight with, you can, with your future is guaranteed in your area, it's just not right. We shouldn't have to go through this. It's actually... It, we've seen really good people moving out of the area because it's just too hard. People, people can't extend onto their house because their, their kids are growing up and they want an extra room. It is so hard to get that done. To be fair, we've had some great help from council um, planners. They're doing their best under very, very difficult conditions. So um, some of you here will actually have had some help from them and I, I can't say enough about a few of them. It's fantastic. <laughs> But uh, well, the, you know, the plan, some of the planners have been great, but boy, they're stuck with some hard rules, and they're trying to work around them. And it's, honestly, life jackets and boats, and, you know, <laughs> can't have you know, cars down your driveway to a rescue boat coming, can't come and pick you up. That's the type of thing some of these people are going through. I mean, you've got to prove that you know, there's no risk of life when you're building. It, it's almost like impossible to get around. So this is how stupid it is. And when I hear that this shouldn't have been in there, and that these people have had to go through all this because there's been an error or a mistake somewhere along the line, that is actually criminal over here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Well, I see. Um, we have with us today um, um, a member of the Linwood Central Ethicate Community Board, Darrell Latham, and he, he would like to speak on behalf of the Redcliffs um, people that he, who he represents, which are also affected by this admission. Darrell. Thank you, Alan. Um, thank you, Dave, Kim and Tim. To you folk out there, I say thank you. I am absolutely blown away with the crowd that we have here tonight, and I think it sends a clear message to City Hall, and that message is, you've got a tiger by the tail. Yes. Now, my name is... <laughs> my name is Daryl Latham. I am a Linwood Central Heathcote uh, Community Board member. The comments I make tonight are my own comments, are not necessarily endorsed by members of uh, uh, my uh, community board because, as you may be aware, I have gone out on a limb and, and I've stood up to uh, be counted uh, on this issue. This is an issue which I have taken an interest in for quite some time now, even prior uh, to be being elected. Some time ago, um, before being elected, I wrote an opinion article for the Christchurch Press called Red Zoning by Stealth. Um, and what has taken place uh, with respect to the residential overlay and the furor that um, you have experienced recently, I would simply put down to being chapter two of that Red Zoning by Stealth. Over the last couple of days, um, we would all be liars if we did not indicate that we have been under quite some considerable uh, strain and emotional stress. And I think in many ways, initially, we've probably lost an inch in height. But as the media support has come around us and the community support has come around us, we've probably grown um, an inch or two taller uh, as well. Now, let me just uh, illustrate that um, when things haven't been so well for each of us, uh, all the others have rallied around with phone calls and said, uh, come on, it's all going to be okay, we're fighting on behalf of the community. And Dave indicated earlier on the role of uh, a councillor. 
Well, the role of a community board member is to get out there and to advocate for your community. When you advocate for your community, you really do need to be, uh, you need to stand up and you need to be counted. Now, there's an old saying that uh, there is a way, sometimes uh, you need to do things right, and we have been criticised for perhaps not following uh, policy the way that we should do, and yes, I accept that and I understand that, but sometimes we haven't got the answers that we've required with respect to the way um, we have carried out things by following policy. There's another saying that says, um, you must do the right thing. So what your councillor and what your community board members have done in this situation have weighed up very carefully about doing things right and at the end of the day we have decided it's more important to do the right thing by our community, by putting our necks on the line and supporting our community. I also need to say that coastal Burwood residents have taken the brunt of this policy. This is something that you've been dealing with now for, I understand, a couple of years. You have, louted, you, you have shouted loud. Your voice is now being heard. But over our side of the ditch, Redcliffs comes into the higher flood management zone and the residential overlay. The whole issue over there is in its infancy. If we get a third of the crowd along tomorrow night in Redcliffs, I will be absolutely thrilled. But I need to tell you, in the last couple of weeks, I have taken um, at least six phone calls from residents um, situated along Beachville Road or along Main Road that have um, been fraught with issues um, related to some of the aspects of the residential overlay that they have been dealing with council and I've asked them what, are they prepared to go public and tell their story. In all cases they have said no we would rather keep our issues privately we want to tell you as a community board member because you are advocating on our behalf and we're in delicate negotiations with council and it's going to compromise the issue for us if we come out and shout loudly from the rooftop. The stress that maybe your councillor and community board member may have been feeling over the last week because we've been working 24-7 on your behalf has only been a small window into the stress that the local residents, Coastal Burwood and Recliffs, have been feeling uh, for some time now. So we take heart in the fact that the stress that we're feeling, the greater pain is being shared by you. Dr Megan Woods, the Regeneration Minister, came up um, about a month or six weeks ago in the square and she was thrilled to say that with respect to cathedral, with respect to the cathedral, that the heart of the city is now being restored. I say it is now time, with respect to Dr. Megan Woods and however Section 71 works and Christchurch uh, Regenerate Minister works, it is now time for the minister return to return the heart into our coastal suburbs and to do the right thing by bringing about the Section 71 and ensuring that that is there for the residents in order to make their lives much easier than what it is now. Now, you're probably all very well aware of Mike Yardley's article in the paper this morning, which was titled, Relief for Residents Must Be the First Priority Here. Yes, it must be the first priority. The second priority must be to ensure that this never, ever happens again. On the other side of the page from Mike Yardley's article, I did a quiet giggle because there was an article titled Weapons of Destruction or a Forced for Social Good. <laughs> Your councillor and community board members do not want to be weapons of destruction. We want to be a force for social good. And that's why we're here tonight and we thank you so much 
for coming along here tonight and supporting us with this issue and for allowing us to stand much taller than what we were when we first come in. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Daryl. It's good to have someone from the other side of the ditch come over and support us. And we, I'm sure we, we often uh, get a wee bit jealous of what you get over there to what we get over here. Alan, can I say, the same meeting is being held in Reckless tomorrow night. You're very welcome to come across. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. We appreciate you coming and, and joining us. Um, the, next, the next speaker is Warwick Schaefer, and Warwick is the Deputy Chair of the Christchurch Coastal Residents United group, and he is going to explain to you um, this policy clause 5221A. Thank you for everybody. Um, just first to acknowledge Tim and the team over there, um, this is really uh, because of them that we're here in many ways. Um, and all the other uh, people that have come along tonight, the um, MPs and uh, councillors as well. Um, really, uh, I've got 10 minutes, I've only got three slides and I'm not going to bore you to death with technical detail, but there is a sense that I think out there of what is this clause and what is this all about. Is that a fair comment? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to give you a very brief background and try and maybe make this a little bit more understandable. So we've got first this map up here, and if you look at the yellow area, that's the residential unit overlay. And I can tell you that is a hard fought piece of yellow. How it came about was that initially, you know about the coastal hazards policy, you might have been here about three years ago when we talked about that. It had three things in it, flooding, inundation and erosion. And there was a big fight at that time to have it thrown out of the fast track process because it wasn't earthquake related. It's, it's global warming, there's plenty of time to do it right. Um, the problem was only two of those things got thrown out. Flooding got left in the fast track process and we found ourselves having to turn up at what the independent hearing panel. Now, the independent hearing panel, if you're not sure what that is, it's a row of three high court judges that you have to turn up and present your expert evidence to and we're just a community group. The council have their lawyers and experts putting their evidence. And so we went through this independent hearing panel process. The council was wanting to stop all building in these areas. So all you could really do is we build a house if it was a blank section, you couldn't build it. If you wanted to add a room, you couldn't. Anything that extended or increased, potentially increased population was going to be what's called non-compliant, i.e. you simply couldn't do it. And we put the case that um, this was far too onerous in a situation where the flooding here, the flood risk here was only due to global warming. That actually, the sea level rise that isn't here yet. So um, to actually be at flood risk, these areas have to, the sea level rise has to have actually happened. So the areas are not at flood risk at the moment. And the panel agreed with that. They, it was a very rigorous, long process. And the panel said, yes, these areas are not at flood risk. Buildings should not be banned in these. And they asked the council to write a special rule for these areas, which is contained within the residential unit overlay where you could build under what's called restricted discretionary activity levels. And that just basically means you can build, provide you tick a few things that are listed to ensure safety to people and property. Now, so this is um, Panel didn't the panel had judges, but they didn't seem to have much else. So they actually asked the council to write the rule for them as a drafting service. And the council did this um, under duress, I think they say. 
uh, because they didn't agree with that at all. They wanted to stop building. Um, so they've said they should follow the panel's instructions and then uh, would have a chance at the end to voice their concerns through policy riders. <coughs> so purely a drafting service. Now, so I'll show you what they drafted, which is... Now, <laughs> you don't have to try and read all that, but it's really just to show you the clause that's uh, the, the missing clause, if you like. So if you look on the, the, on the version uh, put to the IHT by CCC at the hearing, so at, at the hearings, there's a version uh, on your left over here. And you'll see this paragraph in, in uh, yellow with A. That's what was presented to the judges. And then on the other side, at the very end of the process, what happens is that each side gets to put in a closing submission. We put in ours, council put in theirs. In the council closing submission, that clause has vanished. And you can see how it's been rewritten, it's been written out, and at the bottom, the it's been edited so that you can see, uh, well, it's purely locked down, but um, you can see it's not just sort of deleted, it's been re rewritten, okay? So, So, so the first version is uh, provide for development for residential unit on residential zone land where appropriate mitigation can provide, be provided that protects people's safety, well-being and property and in all our, like, other cases avoid subdivision etc. So that's the B. And over on this side here, well that A is just absolutely non-existent so there's no provision anymore for development of residential unit re re on residential zone land anymore. It doesn't exist. Or, and this bit down here is turned into avoid subdivision or use or development in the high flood hazard management area. So all the planners see now when they go to give someone a resource consent is avoid. All right. So that's just to try and show you the difference. Now, actually this is quite complex. You can't just say, oof, it's been deleted. It's not as quite as simple as that. And what is really required here is an inquiry to get to the bottom of... We know it's wrong because the judge has told us something has gone wrong here. We know that for a fact. But what exactly is wrong and where it is and how and how to stop it in the future, I think really does need an inquiry. And I know quite a lot about this stuff, but not even I would claim it be to be able to conclude anything at this stage. So, I just want to, yeah, emphasize the idea that more digging into this is required. Now, um, the other part that I just want to finish on is uh, fixing it. Before we worry about finding the problem and we know there's a problem but who caused it and why and etc, we need to fix it. That's the first thing we need to think about and we need to be collaborative about it. So to fix this, CCRU have always maintained that uh, Section 71 is a good option. Now, minds are always open about that. We don't know everything. Um, the reason we think Section 71 could be, well, it's certainly an option, but maybe there's others that should be investigated. Um, the plan is actually locked at the moment. The council cannot change their own plan. <coughs> so even if they wanted to, I'm not sure if they do, um, but maybe they do now. Um, they can't. 
So to get it fixed, we have to go to the minister who has regeneration powers under section 71. Now this was used in the Redcliffe School. Redcliffe School was built in one of these zones, right? So there's precedent for it. So this is one possible avenue we can see, but we don't know everything. So there may be other options to be considered. Um, to be a really good section 71 proposal, just as a lay person, the minister wants a unanimous kind of approach. They, they want community support. They want to see regenerate. They would like to see elected council get in. Now this is not an elected council issue in my opinion. It's a staff, it's, a, it's, it's in the staff. It's a staff issue in there somewhere. So we need elected members to step in and help fix this up and support us and the local MPs and going to the Minister to correct this if this is the path that's deemed best. Um, I think that's really all that for me. Thank you very much for your time.